The Jordan Center is very glad to welcome Professor Scott Kenworthy, who teaches comparative religion at, at Miami University. His research interests include the history and thought of Eastern Orthodox Christianity, particularly in modern Russia. His first book was The Heart of Russia, Trinity Sergius, Monasticism and Society after 1825, which won a prize from the American Society of Church History. Most recently, he's co-author with Alexander Agajanian of the book Understanding World Christianity, Russia, which was published last year. And he's currently finishing a biography of Petra Tichen, which is under contract at Oxford University Press. Ken Worthy will be joined in conversation by Yanni Kotsonis of NYU's Department of History. So, Scott, welcome. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. I'm humbled to see the audience. There are people out here who know these things better than I do. Um, but I will, um, you know, what I was thinking about, I would talk about today has, of course, changed radically in the past week because we can only all think of about uh, the events that are happening um, in Ukraine. Uh, so after speaking briefly about what's in the book, um, I will try to make some kind of comments about how we can understand what's happening, and particularly the responses of the Orthodox churches in Russia and Ukraine. And hopefully something of what we have done in the book will help illuminate that situation. Um, so the book itself, um, if you haven't seen it, um, is uh, this was actually, it's part of a series uh, called Understanding World Christianity with each volume dedicated to a different, um, either a different country or a different region, let's say of, of different parts of the world. Um, and we were uh, invited to, um, to write this book. Uh, all of the books in the series have the same structure in terms of the same kind of six chapters. So we were we were following uh, a kind of prelate format, um, but it, I think it uh, turned out very successfully. Uh, the team working together with um, Alexander Agajanian from <clears throat> Russian State uh, Humanities University worked out extremely well because my interests are in history and theology and uh, and Alex works more on contemporary um, religion in Russia from kind of more ethnographic and sociological perspectives and also interested in politics and things like that. So we, I think we really complemented each other very nicely. The book is, is written as a broad, you know, kind of primer. Um, the title of course is uh, Christianity uh, in Russia. Uh, we do focus overwhelmingly on Orthodox Christianity as the dominant tradition in Russia, which is not to slight other traditions by any means, and we, we do talk about them in the course of the narrative, um, but I we agreed, I mean, first of all, it's our specialty, but also we agreed that focusing on, <clears throat> on uh, uh, on Orthodoxy was really crucial for, for those who tried to understand Russia. Um, so I'll make some comments about the book and just sort of tell you about what's in it <clears throat> before then um, transitioning to, uh, as I said, to, to make some comments about uh, what's happening in the world today. So the, um, you know, we, we wrote the book really for an audience of, well, of course it's in a series directed towards people who are interested in world Christianity. Um, but of course we also had very much uh, Russian studies audience in mind as well. And that's true of um, people in any field we hope this will be useful for. So whether you're a historian or study literature or political science or anthropology, we hope to go find something uh, in the book uh, and especially your students, um, for those of you who are, who are um, scholars yourselves, we, we've really written it for students. I mean, I teach um, regularly a kind of introduction to Russian studies. So in my head, I was very much writing it for that kind of audience. Um, so the six chapters, the first chapter tries to present, presents an overview of, you know, what is Orthodox Christianity to begin with? Um, again, having in mind my students, um, American students in particular, usually don't have any idea what Orthodox Christianity is or only the vaguest of ideas. Um, so in that chapter, we set forth the basic um, sort of beliefs and practices and some kind of historical background, structure of the church, 
um, try to explain, you know, in what ways orthodoxy is similar to or differs from um, other forms of Christianity. Uh, and then the, the second part of that, the first chapter, um, tries to discuss some distinguishing features of Russian orthodoxy, even within the family, the broader family of Orthodox Christianity. So both in terms of the way it's structured today, um, as well as um, sort of lived religion, right? What religion looks like on the ground, how people practice Russian orthodoxy um, in particular. The second cha chapter is um, on sort of geography, of geographies of Russian Christianity, where we look at different regions um, throughout uh, throughout Russia and kind of explore um, you know how orthodoxy developed in distinctive ways in interaction let's say in in the in western part of the Russian Empire right and territory we're all interested in right now Ukraine and so on how orthodoxy's interaction with um, Western Christians and things like this and the sort of history of uh, relations and um, Greek Catholic Church and things like this played out in the West, how interactions with uh, Muslims in the, in the South or as Orthodoxy Christianity spread with the Russian Empire eastward, um, all those different kind of manifestations, but also a sense of sacred geography in terms of holy places and things like that uh, are also discussed uh, in that book. Uh, in that chapter, in the second chapter, the third chapter provides an overview uh, of the history of, um, of Christianity beginning, you know, sort of from the beginning, right, the conversion of Vladimir, uh, so for the Eastern Slavs, um, all the way up to uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, probably about a third of the chapter is devoted to the Soviet period. Uh, so I deal that you know fairly extensively and drawing from the latest research on that field, um, and uh, in that chapter, like in basically all, many of the chapters, all the chapters in a sense, we try to challenge some of the inherited stereotypes about orthodoxy, um, because I think in the Russian studies field, religion was I don't know for much of the Soviet period because religion had been suppressed by the you know, the Soviets, it was kind of like, it wasn't a question anymore. Uh, and so it wasn't studied uh, very seriously and frequently would be dismissed in a few paragraphs uh, that repeated the typical tropes about church's handmaiden of the state and, you know, these kinds of things. And then you move on to whatever else. Um, and so, uh, of course, in the past um, couple of decades, there's been a huge uh, burgeoning field of people studying um, history of, of Christianity in Russia and many of the names of people here, of course, have participated in that. And while that has, uh, of course, reshaped the field in many ways, um, still often reaches a specialist audience um, and hasn't kind of filtered down to the level of, of uh, you know, sort of broad. There is basically before we wrote this book, there really is no general introduction to kind of uh, Russian orthodoxy um, overall, right? So we wanted to to present that. Um, so we, you know, sort of challenge and nuance some of these old stereotypes um, throughout the book in the history chapter in particular. The fourth chapter, this was again one that was that we were asked to write for the for the series, um, is on biographies, kind of short biographical sketches of key figures illuminate and illustrate some of the historical experience by personalizing it instead of just talking about general trends and things like this um, over the past century. So it's sort of modern. We begin with the kind of um, beginning of the 20th century with uh, key figures. And then in that chapter in particular, uh, we looked at both um, people within Russia and the Soviet Union, as well as um, representative Russian Orthodox Christians abroad. Uh, and try to capture some of that experience. Um, so those two stories uh, are told in parallel. Um, and it's again, you know, church leaders, but also ordinary lay people in some cases, um, men and women, um, we touch in, in that chapter. And I've 
I found many of my students in particular um, like that chapter best of all is kind of the most accessible you could say for, for that kind of audience. Um, the uh, the fifth chapter uh, is a kind of overview of Russian Orthodox theology um, and really Russian Orthodox theology begins properly speaking I would argue or I argue in the book is really begins it's kind of distinctive trajectory from the middle of the 19th century. So from the Slavophiles um, and Vladimir Solovyov um, through the uh, Russian religious renaissance and talk about uh, Sergei Bulgakov and Pavel Florensky and people like this. Um, and then it follows also the story through to the Russian immigration, um, kind of wrapping up the story with Vladimir Lovsky and um, George Florovsky and people like that. So it's kind of uh, this trajectory of how a distinctively Russian way of looking at theology or approaching uh, key questions of Christianity um, kind of culminates in what I'd say is almost a modern re-articulation of what orthodoxy is and how orthodox Christians understand themselves um, in significant ways and in dialogue with Western Christians, which uh, which these 20th century figures um, kind of came to. Uh, and in turn, you know, the Russian thinkers, people like Lovsky and Florovsky and so on, influenced profoundly uh, kind of rethinking of Orthodox theology even among Greeks and Romanians and others. So it's had a, uh, it starts with the Russians, but it has a kind of pan-Orthodox influence. And then the final chapter uh, is focused on um, kind of religion, society, and politics since the since the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and of course, I suppose it's maybe time we drop the the uh, adjective post-Soviet, right? Maybe it's time to stop thinking about that category, but we still did in the book. Um, but uh, so they're trying to show, you know, posing the basic paradox of how there's been this revival of identification with uh, being Russian Orthodox, right? From 20 or 25% of uh, Russians in the Soviet period and to where you get 70 or 75% who will claim to be Russian Orthodox today. And yet at the same time, the percentage of people who say actually actively participate and go to church and things like this has, has not significantly risen since that time period. So what does that mean? There's a, a kind of revival in terms of identification of orthodoxy or ident identification with orthodoxy, um, but not a real shift in terms of actual practice. Uh, so we try to tease out what that means, what, it, you know, what orthodoxy means in Russian society today, the role that it has played um, in the political arena, but you know, beyond that, one has to address the question of, you know, if there is this, obviously there is, but with this kind of drawing together of church and state in, in Russia today, um, one has to understand what orthodoxy means in Russian society for the, you know, for the state to try to draw on that legacy and and bolster itself and influence society uh, by doing so, right? And um, oftentimes there tends to be this kind of monolithic way of thinking about the church um, that sort of focuses on the patriarch and, and Putin, right? And that sort of relationship. Um, and uh, part of what we try to argue is that there's many different currents that the Orthodox Church um, in many ways is as complex as Russian society, right? Russian society is not Putin. Um, the Orthodox Church is not Kirill. Uh, and that there are many different currents going on within that that take approach questions differently and have different concerns and things like this and, and um, look at how all those things play out. So as a general rule, that's kind of what the, the book tries to do. So I will um, transition now to, to trying to say something about um, how we might think about what's happening right now, and especially from, in, in the religious dimension, um, because obviously the relationship between Russia and Ukraine um, has a very important and significant and historic um, relationship in, in the religious sphere. So I'll touch on that. And then hopefully, you know, and then provoke 
try to provoke some questions and and uh, conversation and, and hear from you. So one one thing I wanted to say is that uh, you know we often think of the Orthodox Church as a sort of family of national churches, right? You have the, the Russian Orthodox Church and the Serbian Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church and Romanian and Bulgarian and so on and so forth as like national churches, each of which has their own, most of which, you know, many of which have their own patriarchs and things like this. Um, but I want to suggest that, that there's actually two models of how the Orthodox Church has um, organized itself uh, over um, throughout history. There is the national one, as I was just talking about, but that's really a modern one. That's since the 19th century, where you really have the formation of national churches. Uh, and an older model is, I don't know, uh, a territorial, transnational, maybe imperial one that certainly is rooted in the Byzantine Empire. Uh, if we think back to the very earliest organization of the churches articulated the Council of Chalcedon in the fifth century uh, of the, the Pentarchy, the five um, key leading um, churches uh, or bishops within the church, right? Of Rome, Constantinople, uh, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. Those were territorially defined um, as uh, much of that territory was conquered by the Muslims and the Patriarch of Constantinople emerges as sort of the leading figure um, through much of the, the medieval period. Even then, it's, a, it's it, a kind of the Byzantine imperial model was transcendent of nations. Of course, nations is a modern concept even of itself. But however you want to think about that, it was something that was transnational. It encompassed many different nations. And so when, I, when we look at the Russian Orthodox Church, I think we have to, to uh, think about the fact that it has conceived of itself maybe more along the imperial lines than the national lines. And both of these, by the way, have their, their pitfalls. So the national um, iteration of Orthodox churches tends to often ally itself too closely with a kind of nationalist rhetoric. I mean, we think of uh, abuses in the Serbian Orthodox Church or something like this, where the church and nationalism become very closely tied up um, together and you seem to lose a broader, more universal vision, um, which uh, one could argue that this older, whatever, transnational or imperial model um, maintained. There's a, a Greek scholar, um, Kitromelidis, who, who kind of argues precisely this, that the, the old Orthodox sort of commonwealth under the Patriarch of Constantinople was really more universal than the kind of nationalistic type churches that emerged um, in the 19th century. On the other hand, the imperial model obviously can become very dangerous, especially if the two things merge. If the national becomes the imperial, in other words, the national identity, let's say in the Patriarch of Constantinople becomes kind of hegemonic or clearly what's happening in the case of Russia um, today where the Russian becomes hegemonic over those other territories that it's uh, are in its jurisdiction. So we can think back again to the 19th century, look at what happened with the Patriarch, the Patriarchate of Constantinople was very resistant to separation of church, uh, these new churches, especially the Bulgarian one, right? It took decades and decades for that finally to be reconciled. And so there was this way in which Constantinople identifying it itself as Greek was maybe suppressing the emergence of uh, sort of national churches. And I think the Russian Orthodox Church in, in Imperial Russia really was, it was much more than Russian in the narrow sense of the word, not only including Ukrainian and Belarusian, but also in the 19th century um, until the revolution, Georgian and, uh, and even into North America uh, and so on. But, uh, but perhaps the greatest pitfall, uh, pitfall today is, um, you know, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, um, the Russian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate still claims this notion of their canonical territory 
that basically there may have been the creation of new nations, but the Russian, the Moscow Patriarchate still exercises jurisdiction over effectively the whole territory that was the Soviet Union um, and more or less was the Russian Empire before that. Uh, and that this is its right to maintain that. So it's still more of a kind of imperial model of the church, whereas of course in Ukraine especially, um, there has uh, been more of uh, an embrace, um, at least in certain quarters of this national model that because just like when the Serbs and the Greeks and the Bulgarians and the Romanians became independent nations, they eventually got independent churches, autocephalous being the, the technical term in Orthodox language, they got autocephalous churches. So also Ukraine should have its own autocephalous church and be independent from the Moscow Patriarchate. So that's been a question ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and, uh, and of course, as we all know, they, the, Moscow has resisted this idea of, of the Ukrainian church um, becoming independent. Um, I think um, the, uh, the roots of the current or the conflict as it has developed um, between Russia and Ukraine in the religious sphere is that the Moscow Patriarchate has really become hegemonic, as I said, perhaps especially with this Russian world, you know, the Ruski Mir concept which was developed in many ways within the church. This was one area where the church really contributed a kind of ideology that then becomes embraced by, um, by the state and, and part of the political ideology. And even in Putin's speeches um, in the past you know, week or so, 10 days, we can see echoes of this very clearly. And I will mention here, um, <clears throat> Father uh, Cyril Kavarun, Kirill Kavarun, um, who is uh, uh, an Orthodox theologian, uh, Ukrainian, but of the Moscow Patriarchate, who um, as a young scholar was brought um, under the wing of Patriarch Kirill after Patriarch uh, Kirill became Patriarch in 2009. He was a, a kind of theological advisor to um, Kirill in those early years. He's, uh, if you're familiar with, um, Ilarion Alfeyev, who's today kind of Patriarch Kirill's right-hand man in many ways. Um, Kirill Havarun was a kind of 10 years younger version of, of Hilarion, you know, somebody who'd gotten a PhD in, in England, just like Alfeyev has. Um, brilliant young theologian, steeped in patristics and so on. But then uh, as Kirill was, Patriarch Kirill was developing the Russian world concept, um, Father Cyril Khabarun understood right away that this was, from a Ukrainian perspective, that this was an imperial ideology that implicitly denied the um, Ukrainian statehood. And he, uh, he stood up to Patriarch Kirill and wrote a kind of memo to him to critique this and say, this is really dangerous. As a consequence of, he, of which he lost his job um, and has been in kind of permanent exile outside of, uh, of Russia ever since. Um, and is definitely a persona non grata as far as the Russians are concerned. But he was, I mean, I think the events of the last week, if we hadn't, if this wasn't proven before, the events of the last week have really shown that, um, that Father uh, Cyril Havarun's insights were correct all those years ago. Um, and, and so um, the ways in which this Russian imperial idea uh, to present great Russians as the the big brother and little Russians, you know, to use the old terminology of, of Ukrainians and Belarusians as sort of, you know, junior brothers in the partnership. Um, this is something that the, the church has latched onto in the past, you know, especially in the past um, dozen or so years uh, that um, obviously has extremely dangerous consequences. Um, also just a, a few comments about, um, you know, church state relations in Russia. Um, this often um, oversimplified, 
um, you know, with all the church has been, always has been, and always will be sort of a handmaiden of the state. Um, but I think a lot of the more recent scholarship has shown that, you know, it's a relationship that's been a complex one um, that has, uh, you know, oscillated through history and that even in the 19th century, uh, after the Petrine reforms and everything else, that there were, you know, church leaders who were, despite restrictions from the state, who were doing their best to, uh, to pursue the church's interests and not the state's uh, interest. And of course, in the Soviet period, it's a very complicated story, and this is what the book is about, what book I'm currently writing is also about um, the first half of the Soviet period before World War II, um, the dominant story is one of intense persecution um, of the church. And I give details about that um, in, in this book, uh, especially under the terror under Stalin where, where uh, the church is almost obliterated. Um, and the kind of idea or, or uh, image of the church as sort of compromised and complicit with the state and so on, that this, first of all, is something that um, only emerges really after World War II and after the church has been almost completely destroyed um, as a kind of modus vivendi for the church's survival in, in the late Soviet period. Um, and in terms of the, the post-Soviet period too, relations between um, Alexei and Yeltsin were very, very different. Um, and the, even the relationship between Patriarch Alexei um, and um, Putin were, were not quite so cozy <laughs> as they have become between Kirill and Putin. Ironically enough, when Kirill became Patriarch, um, people who one might consider to be, you know, the more progressive or open or liberal within the Orthodox Church, actually, most of them were in favor of, of Kirill becoming patriarch. He was somebody who had traveled in the West and spent a lot of time in the West. Um, and, you know, he is a very smart person. Um, and a lot of his ideas, he didn't come across in his sort of theological understanding and stuff like this as anything oh, very fundamentalist. And so I think at the time he became, was elected patriarch, people thought he was the best of the options available at the time. And so I think, what has transpired since his election has, has taken at least many observers um, by surprise. Uh, what motivated this increasingly, ever increasingly close relationship between um, the patriarchate and, and the presidency in Russia, I can only, I guess the way I would put it is that, you know, in the 90s maybe, the uh, the church hoped that the in the process of recovery from the Soviet period they would be able to um, find their basis of support kind of from the ground up from the people right kind of the way it works in America right where the churches are supported by the parishioners um, and that somehow that didn't happen um, they didn't know how to make it happen or for whatever reason um, they didn't pull it off. Um, or that project failed. And so Kirill at a certain moment seems to have embraced the idea that the, the best way to kind of re-Christianize Russian society to ensure that the church is relevant and a key player in kind of shaping Russian values and so on was with this alliance with the state. And this has become really explicit in, in the kind of conservative turn that especially I think has happened um, in the past decade, you know, after in response to the protests of 2011, 2012, um, and the aftermath of Pussy Riot and all those kinds of things, where the embrace has just become, you know, very much uh, complete, you could say. Interestingly enough, our, as I remember, Kirill gave this uh, kind of a, uh, a message during the protests, it was a Christmas message um, during the, that winter of 2011, 2012, where he kind of, even then was like, we need to bring both sides together to talk. And I don't know, my guess is he got a call from the Kremlin or something like that, because he never has spoken like that since. Ever, ever since then, it's always been, you know, Putin is the guy who, you know, who represents Russia's interests, um, you know, a miracle for Russia or something, whatever it was that he said. Um, and so, uh, it, 
you know, this sort of way in which this alliance of the traditional values as being anti-Western and um, part of Putin, you know, the kind of self-understanding or ideology of the Putin government is tied closely with the um, way the church presents itself. Um, you know, it's a kind of, you could say it's a kind of marriage of convenience, uh, I think, um, where the, uh, the church tried to assert itself as a major player in Russian society through that, um, by, by that means. Um, of course, um, but as time has gone on, it's clear that the, uh, the, uh, the state has the upper hand so that basically, you know, Kirill has virtually lost all moral authority, especially with what's happening right now. He doesn't dare challenge, challenge Putin. So that seems to be the, the unfortunate outcome of his attempt to give more role to the church. Um, it seems to be uh, undermining it. Um, but, as, but as I said, Russia is not a monolith and that there are other currents. There's a lot of criticism within, you know, the Russian Orthodox Church. It's hard to voice that very much, um, but that there is people who are, are not too keen on that. On the other hand, there is this way in which this embrace of the traditional values and stuff like that is having resonance even among American evangelical Christians and things like this, or some of whom are looking to, you know, Putin and the Russian Orthodox Church as kind of the preserver of traditional Christian values in the face of all this secularization and liberalization in Western societies and things like that. Um, but uh, certainly this is not the only way the Orthodox Church can be. Um, one just has to look at the ecumenical patriarch um, Bartholomew of Constantinople, who takes a very different approach to things, whose who's emphasis, he was the one called by, uh, labeled by um, Al Gore as the green patriarch for his emphasis on um, the environmental crisis and developing a kind of echo theology, who's had a lot of focus on human rights and things like this, and doesn't talk about traditional values as a, as a thing to pursue right so there are there's a really a growing divide in the orthodox world i'd say right now between the position that is represented by the patriarch of moscow and this embrace of of the traditional values and kind of anti-western discourse of you know the liberal decadent west versus the position um i'd say represented by the the patriarch of constantinople um, that um, embraces, you know, a very different um, agenda. In some ways, that broader tension also played into what has transpired um, in Ukraine over the past few years, this kind of competition almost for, for um, leadership, you know, symbolic leadership as, and real leadership in the Orthodox world between Constantinople and Moscow. Um, played out in, in Ukraine. So as uh, maybe many of you are familiar, um, uh, right from the beginning of the independence of Ukraine, there was an attempt to create uh, an autocephalous church. Uh, the church in, there, were, there was a petition actually right from the beginning to allow the Ukrainian church to be uh, granted autocephaly by Moscow. Moscow said no. There was the revival of an old autocephalous church that has had, you know, sort of continuous existence outside of Ukraine. that was created in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution originally that revived itself or came back, you could say, uh, and existed in, in Western Ukraine. Um, and then the former head of the Russian Orthodox Church in Kiev, uh, the Metropolitan of Kiev, um, Filaret Denisenko, um, basically broke from Moscow and declared himself to be the head of an autocephalous uh, Ukrainian church and eventually declared himself to be the patriarch of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Um, and so for a long time, you had uh, essentially three Orthodox churches operating in Ukraine, uh, the older autocephalous church, the Kiev Patriarchate and the Moscow Patriarchate. Moscow Patriarchate was the, the dominant church in Ukraine uh, and was the only one recognized by the rest of the Orthodox world. 
pressures to have uh, a legitimate, let's say, Orthodox Church of Ukraine became more intense after 2014, for obvious reasons, um, because of this sense that, you know, can the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the, of the Moscow Patriarchate be, you know, separate from Russian pressures and things like this. Uh, and, uh, and finally, in um, 2019, Patriarch Bartholomew granted autocephaly to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which effectively united the Kiev Patriarchate and the, this older autocephalous church into one church. They invited others from the Moscow Patriarchate to join too. That was the hope, but of course it didn't really happen. Um, so instead of having three Orthodox churches, so is an overgeneralization, now there are two, uh, but they're kind of competing with one another. Um, so that's kind of, but you know, Russia has, has broken communion with Constantinople over this. They have found ways of punishing those who side with um, Constantinople. There's a whole situation going on in Africa, which I can talk about if anybody's interested, um, that is a consequence of this. So it's, it's causing a serious rift in the Orthodox world. It's sort of, you know, Moscow says, Ukraine is our daughter church and only we would have the right to give it autocephaly. Whereas Constantinople says, only Constantinople as the sort of first bishop in the Orthodox world has ever had the, the authority to grant autocephaly to, um, to any church. So it's um, kind of com competition, as I said, between the, the leadership of those two sees is, is um, part of what's playing out. But the discourse in Russia, um, you know, not only all the discourse about the, the neo-Nazis and the genocide in Eastern Ukraine and all this kind of stuff, but also um, that somehow this Ukrainian autocephalous church is a concoction of the West, um, that basically the patriarch of Constantinople is just a tool of America, and that this is a way of uh, destroying Russian orthodoxy from within. This has been part of the discourse of, of the um, Moscow Patriarchate in the past, uh, especially in the past couple of years. So just coming now, last few comments I want to make is, you know, what's happened in the past week. So I'm sure um, probably all of you are familiar with Putin's speech um, that he gave on February 21st, basically announcing his justification for the military operation uh, in Ukraine, where he's, you know, said in the speech, according to the Kremlin translation, uh, of the speech, I would like to emphasize again that Ukraine is not just a neighboring country for us. It is an inalienable part of our own history, culture, and spiritual space. These are our comrades, those dearest to us, not only colleagues, friends, and people who once served together, but relatives bound by blood, family ties. Since time immemorial, people living in the Southwest of what has historically been Russian land have called themselves Russians and Orthodox Christians. Right. So this, there is a way in which religion plays into his discourse about Ukraine. There's been a debate among scholars, is, is this a religious war or not? My own take on it is that Putin isn't really motivated so much by religion. This is kind of instrumentalized, but it does help convince the Russian population, whatever Putin, Putin's understanding of it is, um, it, does, it does have some power um, in Russia itself. Um, as in 2014, when Patriarch Kirill was actually very quiet, um, so also he's only spoken out twice in the past week. The first was this very general, vague official statement, you know, calling for peace sort of thing. And then on Sunday, he gave a sermon uh, where he addressed it a little bit more explicitly. Um, but in this, again, kind of characteristically ambiguous language. So let me just read you a passage. He says, God forbid that the present political situation in fraternal Ukraine so close to us should be aimed at making the evil forces that have always strived against the unity of Rus and the Russian church gain the upper hand. Uh, God forbid that a terrible line stained with blood of our brothers 
should be drawn between Russia and Ukraine. We should pray for the restoration of peace, the restoration of good fraternal relations from, between our peoples. Well, he doesn't name this evil, right? And of course, if you're sitting in Ukraine, you say the evil that is dividing us is Putin. Um, but, but obviously that's how, not how Kirill's Russian audience is going to read that. But it's ambiguous enough that by not naming it, you know, he can sort of disavow the, oh, you know, whatever. And he goes on just to say, may the Lord protect the from fratricidal battle, the peoples comprising the one space of the Russian Orthodox Church. It must not be allowed to give the dark and hostile external forces, right? So we know how this is interpreted in Russia, an occasion to laugh at us. We should do everything to preserve peace between our peoples while protecting our common historical motherland. That's the official English translation from the Patriarchate in Russian, he actually says fatherland, our one common fatherland, which I think has a different ring to it in my ear, um, against every outside action that can destroy this unity. So even that just denies the Ukrainian statehood, right? A common fatherland between Russians and Ukrainians. So the Russian, the, the Moscow, the official leadership of the Moscow Patriarchate has really just you know, isn't challenging what Putin is doing at all. If anything, they are providing, continuing to provide a kind of ideological support for it. But very importantly, and this is what I want to end with, um, Metropolitan Anufri, who is the head of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate and the Holy Synod of that church have made very strong and very unambiguous statements. Um, so on the first day of the conflict, uh, Metropolitan Anufri said, um, defending the sovereignty and integrity of Ukraine, we appeal to the president of Russia and ask him immediately to stop the fratricidal war. The Ukrainian Russian peoples came out of the Dnieper baptismal font and the war between these people is a repetition of the sin of Cain who out of envy killed his own brother. Such a war is not justified either by God or by the people. Um, and then uh, just yesterday was an appeal of the Holy Synod of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Canada, the Moscow Patriarchate. Um, for our part, we once again confirm that the Ukrainian Orthodox Church has always supported and continues to support the sovereignty of the state that is, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Realizing our, our special spiritual responsibility, today we turn to His Holiness Patriarch Kirill of Moscow and all Russia, Your Holiness, we ask you to intensify your prayer for the Ukrainian people. Um, say your first hierarchical word on the cessation of fratricidal bloodshed on the Ukrainian land and call on the leadership of the Russian Federation to immediately stop hostilities that are already threatening to turn into a world war. Um, and also asks Putin on behalf of the multi-million flock of the Ukrainian church uh, to do everything possible to put an end to the sin of armed confrontation between our two fraternal peoples and start the negotiation process. This terrible war has already dealt a heavy blow to relations between Ukraine and Russian peoples. If the bloodshed is not stopped, the abyss between our peoples may remain forever, right? So they're at least in that church, still subordinate to Moscow, um, but clearly showing its, its, its allegiance, its first allegiance is to Ukraine. Um, and I think that's uh, an important point to note. Um, and I will stop there. Um, thank you. I think we, uh, Yanni um, will facilitate some questions. So please you raise your hand or post your questions in the chat. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm, and not just questions, but your comments, because as I said, there are people here who uh, know these things every bit as well as I do. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Scott. That was, um, uh, it, it's, so it, the, the, I think you're right when you say that there's, uh, there's a tendency to, um, among academics to dismiss the history of religion and the history of churches and not to engage in it at all. Not necessarily to dismiss it, it just never comes their way. Um, and many of us are trained that way because of some notion of what secular belongs where, right? Uh, I mean, you could say, well, you know, a lot of the scholarship that was written 
was actually written by believers, and so you have to have faith in order to read them. So this is sometimes true, but not always. I mean, the first great work of historical scholarship, considered modern scholarship in history, was the history of the papacy, right? Um, written in the 19th century. So why not, right? Um, so if you'd like to comment on that, or you could, or about how it's not always easy to write this kind of thing and to, uh, and to secure an audience, um, uh, but you don't have to, because you could just, we could just skip to where I think most people's brains are right now, which is the situation unfolding in Ukraine. Um, on that count, um, I'd had a different question, which is um, a lot of what we've been seeing happening, and now you're reconfirming this with your discussion of church relations, is that we're seeing a border coming down harder and harder over the past, well, certainly since 2014. Um, and we've seen it in all sorts of connections. And so I've been seeing studies in all sorts of connections, such as infrastructure, roads, trains, um, um, border checks, closed borders, in all sorts of ways, uh, reconfirming that these are two separate countries, and in some ways, reinforcing the border where it didn't exist. Um, in some cases, um, uh, well, uh, confirming not simply that these are two different countries, but these are also two countries which are um, more and more sealed off from each other. Now, this is the good work most first and foremost of the current government in Russia, um, which is the exact opposite of what they claim to be doing, and yet that's what they're doing. Um, uh, but it's also reinforced in other directions, you know, sort of, you know, to, you know, to, to reinforce this kind of orientation that you're talking about. So, and I wonder if you see the, uh, the stance of the, um, of the sort of the Orthodox Metropolitan, meaning the one that is still under the Moscow Patriarchate, if you see their stance as a movement in that direction towards schism, basically. Okay. Um, yeah, just a, a comment on the, uh, the first point about uh, secular versus religious history, this actually has a long history in as much as even in 19th century Russia, um, one of the great um, historian, you know, the, one of the fathers of Russian history, Vasily Klushevsky, um, came from this ecclesiastical background. And yet when he was writing his secular history, um, didn't, uh, didn't really talk about church history because there was this sense of divide between you know, secular history is what you do in the university and, and religious history is what you do in the theological academies and things like this. So there, there is a history to it, um, you know, divide, but I think, um, uh, and maybe, maybe that was inherited by earlier Western historians of Russia as well under the influence of uh, people like Milikov and, and those who kind of gave birth to parts of this, this history. Um, but um, but of course you know uh, my uh, my mentor Gregory Fries, um, who is somebody who definitely came at this history not as a believer but as this is an interesting you know historical this is the clergy is an interesting social group that we should understand the church is you know the most the largest the most important non governmental institution in Russia um, you can't understand Russian history apart from it um, and so he above all. Uh, demonstrated that it is definitely not only possible but extremely important to to approach it um, as a secular historian as well. Um, turning to your uh, the second question, yes, I would agree that there really uh, seems to be. I mean, the political culture uh, and everything else of uh, Ukraine versus Russia seems to be um, you know, the divide seems to be deepening ever more. Um, you know, if that was not so visible in the 90s or, you know, in the, even in the 2000s, it certainly has become much more clear in the last eight years. Um, but it's important to note that the history of Ukraine, the history of Orthodoxy in Ukraine has had its own distinctive path always, right? Its separation from Russia did not begin in 1991 or 1992 that um, after the Mongol invasions um, and then the uh, much of Ukraine and, and uh, Belarus becoming part of um, Poland and Lithuania and then the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that or the, the Metropolitan of Kiev um, remained subordinate to the Patriarchate of Constantinople until the 17th century. Um, 
uh, when when you know the eastern part of Ukraine was kind of annexed by uh, the Russian Empire, uh, and even that was still only um, the eastern part of Ukraine. And so, you know, Ukrainian Orthodoxy had its own distinctive tradition that, in some ways, got russified only in the 19th century. Heather Coleman uh, is writing this history right now. Uh, very, very much look forward to, to her study. So in many ways, what's been happening is a kind of revival, you could say, of a tradition that did exist before. And that's really important to keep in mind. Um, one of the questions you know, that people like Father Cyril Khabarun and others have raised is, you know, with Russia representing this pole of an orthodoxy that is you know, the sort of bastion of traditional values and so on, would Ukrainian orthodoxy represent a different approach to orthodoxy? You know, Ukraine is less religiously homo homogenous, let's say, than, than Russia is. Um, and, um, you know, there's much greater sense of a separation of church and state and religious pluralism as, as part of the fabric of Ukrainian society. Um, and if Ukraine orients itself towards the West more and towards this sort of different set of values, it's, it's entirely possible to think of uh, a Ukrainian orthodoxy that really has a different emphasis and therefore different influence on sort of the shape of the orthodox world. But that, that remains to be seen. But as far as the actual question, um, so there was a webinar yesterday in which Father Sil Khabarun and others um, participating and, and precisely this question came up, right? That in 2019, when there was this move to grant autocephaly, the overture was there towards the church that belonged to, you know, that was subordinate to, to the Moscow Patriarchate. Um, but they said, no, no, thanks. We, we are the right, we're the legitimate church. We're not gonna join you. Um, but, you know, this could play out very differently in the future, um, depending on what happens in Ukraine. Um, but it's it's hard to imagine. Um, a lot of people are going to want to stay subordinate to Moscow, Moscow's jurisdiction going forward after this. So yeah, I agree with you. Putin seems to uh, accomplish the exact opposite of what he sets out to do. Yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, continue along the same lines with a question from the chat from Patrick Leach. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to actually write I'm going to speak the abbreviations. Can you expound upon the efforts of the Russian Orthodox Church to pressure other Orthodox churches that support Ukrainian Orthodox Church autocephaly? Yeah. So you know when when um, when the Ecumenical Patriarch granted the Tomas of autocephaly to uh, to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And then Moscow effectively excommunicated uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople. <laughs> we were all sort of on the edge of our seats. Is this going to be, you know, another 1054 moment where the church is divided? But, you know, the Slavic churches line up behind um, uh, behind Moscow and the Greek and so on churches line up behind Constantinople and the Orthodox Church is, is totally divided. A lot of the churches, you know, try to remain neutral and says this is a spat between Moscow and Constantinople and doesn't involve us. They haven't exactly, you know, been terribly forthcoming about uh, um, recognizing the new church, but they've tried to find this way in between. Um, but the, the biggest issue is, um, so the, the Patriarch of Alexandria, the Greek, uh, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Alexandria, has recognized um, the uh, the Ukrainian the autocephaly of the Ukrainian Church as granted by by Constantinople, and what one of the ways in which uh, Moscow has tried to punish the Patriarchate of Alexandria for this is that in recent decades there has been a movement of Africans to come to Orthodoxy as a kind of non um european form of christianity it doesn't have any legacy with colonialism and things like this um especially in in uganda uh and a few countries um and fairly substantial and because the patriarch of of alexandria is so the patriarch of all all of africa as far as the orthodox are concerned they naturally found their ecclesiastical home 
under the Patriarch of Alexandria. So now Moscow is going into Africa and basically trying to lure, and successfully in many cases, lure, maybe buy, we don't know, um, African clergy away from the Patriarch of Alexandria into uh, creating this kind of separate parallel jurisdiction that belongs to Moscow. I mean, it's completely crazy to think of the Mo Mo Russian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate present in Uganda or something like that. Um, but there you have it. So that that's you know probably the most egregious case where there has been an explicit pressure, um, you know, on on one of the churches that that recognized the Ukrainian Orthodox. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ecumenical uh, patriarchates, I mean, they're, they're pretty explicit in private. I mean, they're saying that they go into these meetings and the Russians disrupt, so they just don't have meetings with the Russians. They go and they do nothing and then they meet separately and they're all sympathetic to the Ukrainian case and they can't deal with the Russians anymore. It's been, it's been going on for years now. Yeah. Um, but I mean, again, you know, um, you can't actually you can't excommunicate the, the ecumenical patriarch. I mean, it just you just can't. You know, so, I mean, how else can I put this? Anyway, so we have a question, a live one from Elise uh, Elise Virchafta. Hi, Scott. Um, Hi. I actually want to get away from all the politics with my question and go back to something you mentioned in describing the book, and that was the distinction you made between identification and progress, which. I thought was very interesting. And I don't know, maybe that trajectory is going to disappear now or, or you know, become much more muted because of every, all the, everything happening. But I was curious, it, it reminds me of um, uh, what Charles Taylor has written about people, you know, not becoming more secular in the 20th and 21st centuries, but actually becoming eclectic in their religious consciousness and orientation. So I'm wondering if you, you know, see any evidence of that in, in what you call here the, the practices. I mean, it's, it's common, right, in, in modern religions, like in Reformed Judaism, where people aren't practicing, but they still identify. So I'm just curious, you know, what more you can say about that. Thank yeah. you. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a, a, a sociologist, Grace Davy, who wrote a book about Western Europe that's very important, where she talks about believing but not belonging or something like this. Like people, you know, they still have a sort of residual faith, but they don't express it actively. They're kind of happy the churches are still there and government supported, so that when they need them, they can turn to them. But in the meantime, you know, they're sort of they're happy to to ignore the churches, this kind of thing. And and there may be some of that. Um, or something similar in the in the Russian case, Greg Fries actually uh, also wrote about this, and he sort of flipped it. He says it's it's belonging but not believing. <laughs> However, you want to think about it, but it's you know similar or reverse kind of perspective. But definitely, the, in terms of, I think a lot of people in Russia who you know, if you ask them, they'll say, "Yeah, I'm Russian Orthodox." But then, if you kind of dig a little clo more closely at what they actually believe or what they practice or something like this they you know they might believe in karma and they might you know whatever do this yoga and various things like this right so there is definitely i think um the clergy of course tries to fight against this and and give people a proper christian understanding of their faith um, but if people don't go to church they're not going to hear that <laughs> anyways um and so i think on the ground there is definitely a lot of this kind of eclectic mixing and matching and people don't necessarily say i think in the united states you know if you grew up baptist you'd have a harder time saying yes i'm a baptist but i believe in karma and do these other things um but in russia it's um you know i think it's easier for people to kind of mix it and say yeah i'm orthodox but i you know i do these other things and not really see that as as um being a contradiction one other point i would make is that you know in the soviet period of course um practicing publicly could bring consequences right they were the regime in the in the late soviet period they weren't unless you were really a very vocal dissident or something like this, they weren't arresting people and sending them to the gulag anymore, but they were watching. And so if you were an active religious believer, then 
you could pretty much guarantee you were you would never get promoted in your job your kids wouldn't get into the university you know they found ways of pressuring you and so people began to express their religious practice if they maintained it um, at home and so i have the sense that you know there may be a degree to which you know there's certain kinds of traditions are kept in the home that aren't you know that don't necessarily involve going to church because for decades you you know that you couldn't and or you really didn't want to and that was part of it you know i um i was a, a fulbrighter in romania and um, spent a lot of time in romania and i see a kind of contrast um at multiple levels but you know sort of religious practice um maybe it's changing right now and anka who is on the call too can can uh, pitch in but at least up until recently the levels of church going and things like this are much higher in Romania than they are in, in Russia. And I think a lot of that has to do with the shorter time span, right, of communism, because, you know, 70 years just completely broke people's connection um, with the church and with the traditions that might be kept in the home and things like this. Um, but also the, the regime, it had its moments of persecution of, of the church uh, in Romania, but then eventually, you know, Ceausescu actually sort of like, well, orthodoxy is part of our national myth and understanding. And so, you know, their pressures against the church were much less intense than, than in the Soviet Union. Uh, we're gonna go back and forth to the chat. Uh, this is from James Meador. How should we understand the historical arc of the Department of External Church Relations? I assume that's the, is that the Russian Orthodox Church? Yeah. What kind, of, what kind of institution is this? And what would a nuanced understanding of its political projects look like? Wow, that's a, you know, question that uh, my co-author really should be the one to answer more than me. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm happy if anybody else wants to jump into this, this question um, may know more than I do. So it, it is something that, um, so this has been since the Soviet period has been a very important part of the, of the church's infrastructure um, that in the Soviet, it existed in the Soviet period. And it was kind of the, you know, the, the church's foreign office, you could say. Um, that existed to uh, liaison with foreign Christians and sort of present the face of the Russian Orthodox Church to the world and to the World Council of Churches and these kinds of things. And uh, I think it really started under um, uh, Metropolitan Nicodem and so on. So actually, it, it among other things, you know, sort of this wing cultivated the most educated and actually and most open um, people within the Orthodox Church in the, in the Soviet period. And in, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it became kind of Kirill's fiefdom um, while he was still, um, you know, metropolitan of Smolensk, not an important place, but because he was head of that department, um, it was the kind of intellectual engine and powerhouse of, of, the, um, of the Moscow Patriarchate in lots of ways. So for example, in 2000, they, they issued this, you know, it's called the social basis of the, you know, Russian Orthodox Church is a kind of social doctrine where they lay out in a fairly systematic fashion, the church's position on everything from church state relations to moral questions, to bioethics, to, you know, war and peace, like all these kinds of questions. And, and that was a product of, of that department and so on. Um, it's actually quite a, a, an interesting document and, and, maybe um, that was before the real conservative turn to the traditional values. It's more nuanced. Um, but, um, you know, Kirill, of course, since he shifted um, to, to being patriarch and now uh, Metropolitan Ilarion Alfeyev is occupying the position of the head of that office, um, who is, you know, a person he was in Western Europe for a long time, is uh, somebody who's quite conversant with uh, the Western world while condemning its decadence and all this kind of stuff. But I can't really say, unfortunately, much more than that about its, its you know, current role. It doesn't seem to play the, the kind of importance that it, uh, that it did when Alexei was patron. Um, Jane Burbank, 
Uh, thanks so much. Wonderful talk. Um, I want to ask uh, a question also associated with the uh, uh, Orthodox Church's role in the recent rewriting of Russian history into the Russian world version. And in particular, I want to uh, ask about uh, connections to Eurasianist thought. Um, I'm thinking in particular of the church's uh, role in sponsoring the um, historical exhibit, uh, Russia Maya Historia, and the, which from 2017 was shown all across the country and still is. And in it, um, one can see very clearly, at least I could, two currents of, of uh, inspiration. One is the church. Um, uh, and, and the other is a uh, uh, Gumilyov version of Eurasianism. So my question is, so how much uh, input or um, uh, collaboration is there between the various, various neo-Eurasianists and uh, members of the uh, church hierarchy who are responsible for this kind of rewrite of Russian history? Mm. Yeah, that's... That's an interesting question. And it seems to me that, um, boy, I'm, I'm getting a little out of my, my specialty here, but it seems to me that there, there are differences between the Eurasianist yes. approach and the Russian world approach, right? Um, and so there may be kind of competition um, and there definitely is an intellectual competition within the church itself. So that exhibit was, um, you know, whatever, inspired or organized by um, Tikhon Shevkonov, who is clearly a, you know, an important player in the, in the Russian Orthodox Church, long reputed to be Putin's uh, confessor and so on. And, um, you know, his take on the Soviet period, for example, uh, where there is this kind of, um, how do I want to say this? Um, you know, soft take on Stalin, you know, really an emphasis, real, you know, sort of, yes, there, was, there are the new martyrs and things like that, who, you know, sort of sacrificed themselves to the Russian nation, but you don't blame that on Stalin. You know, mm -hmm. The emphasis on Stalin is the one who built the great power, great you know, stability and defeated the Nazis and so on. So it's a very particular take on, on the Soviet past. But there's also um, St. Tikhon's University in Moscow, which was the first ever established, as far as I know, um, Orthodox university. So it's meant to be a university, not just like a seminary or something like this, where they teach other subjects. But um, their real focus and contribution has been telling the story of persecution under, under the Soviet regime. And those people are absolutely, you know, have zero patience for any kind of attempt to rehabilitate Stalin. They're the first ones to condemn him and condemn the terror and condemn his, you know, um, the things, you know, uh, that he did, especially the Orthodox believers, obviously, um, during the terror and things like that, and expose that and try to publicize it and bring it to light. Um, also, Metropolitan Ilarion Alfeyev has, um, you know, always been very explicit in his condemnation of Stalin. I'm not really answering your question because I'm not too sure of the... Um, of the Eurasianist influence in there. It's one of the currents. It's, it seems like there's this sort of smorgasbord of options that people can pick from when they construct these ideologies. Mm -hmm. And there are different currents who draw from different of these palettes to, to concoct this sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, that may be, that's one of the elements that influences some currents but it's not something that would influence others. And so, again, this is what I'm trying to say that, that the Orthodox Church taken as a whole, even in Russia is, it's complex and there are multiple levels going on and there's even competing intellectual currents that are at play. It's important to keep in mind. All right, uh, we have a question here from Eugene Clay on the chat. Metropolitan Epiphany of the new Orthodox Church of Ukraine has made very sharp language in his 
own declarations comparing the current Russian invasion to a series of Russian depredations going back to 1169. When Andrei Bogolyubsky sacked Kiev, uh, what do you think about Epifani's leadership in the past three years? I mean, I haven't heard the name Andrei Bogolyubsky in 20 years. I'm so glad this is here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's funny how people, uh, you know, or not funny, but um, you know, drawing on history, even Putin is crazy speech trying to argue why Ukraine isn't a real nation based upon you know, this reading of history. We, we, we wonder sometimes whether uh, our discipline has any, um, those of us who are historians, right? What, what's the significance of our discipline? But when you look at this part of the world, everybody's debating the meaning of history and how history shaped, uh, shaped these nations and current events and things like this. Um, yeah, I deliberately didn't focus on the Ukrainian, the autocephalous Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Uh, and Eugene, you probably know more about, could say more about Epiphany than, than I could. Um, but the reason that I didn't say, I didn't really want to focus on that um, is because, um, because it's sort of predictable, right? It's understood, it's assumed that they will condemn the Russian invasion um, because they wanted to break from, uh, you know, they, they wanted to be separate from Moscow to begin with. And they've been very clear on that kind of position since 2014. Um, as far as his leadership, I, you know, um, I mean, to some degree, it doesn't seem like the Ukraine, the autocephalous Ukrainian church has lived up to quite what people were hoping it would. Um, but I'm a little hesitant to, hesitant to say a whole lot more, more than that. But I think, just to come back to what I was actually saying when I was talking, uh, I think it's very important for Russians in Russia to hear what Anufri is saying, right? Because Anufri is their guy, he's their man, and they'll believe what he says. Of course, his statements and that the statement of the the um, Holy Synod that I read from are not being published in Russian, uh, you know, Russian Orthodox sites. Um, but I have pointed this out to Russians who are still kind of buying the Russian propaganda. It's like, well, if this guy is your guy, then how come he's saying this? Right? So it's uh, it's important to emphasize. And we have a question from Alexander Mikhailovich. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question about sacred geography, uh, which is, you know, a part of your book and your general research. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one of the things that has come up, uh, well, in Putin's speeches and other statements by Kirill and others in the upper echelons of the, of the Russian Orthodox Church is this notion of Kiev as a kind of sacred site. Um, almost as if it was say a kind of like Jerusalem or lost Vatican or, or Santiago de Compostela, like a pilgrimage site. And if we lose that uh, from you know, the arena of Ruski Mir, you know, there's going to be this kind of uh, almost spiritual trauma that will result. Uh, and yet um, this is, I for one, um, have never particularly felt that this is, that many Russian Orthodox believers feel this strongly. Although, although, as you point out, you know, different believers, different parishes, you know, might have, you know, various or conflicting emphases about this. In your own research, have you, have you gotten the sense that this is actually a very strong element? Uh, is it stronger in some parts of Russia than in others or in certain parishes? I mean, I was wondering if you could, com could comment on that a little bit. You know, when, I, when I'm not engaged in, in these kinds of questions right now, most of my mental time is spent in uh, 1917 and, <laughs> and the early, you know, early part of the 20th century, which is what I'm writing the current book on. Um, and uh, in, in our collaborative project, uh, these sort of things were, were really um, uh, tackled by, uh, by my co-author because he's the expert in that sort of thing. So a lot of the, the material um, 
you know, I'm not sure I can talk about what's like happening on the ground in terms mm -hmm. of way different Orthodox believers may be responding to these things mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, you know, it, it is possible to trace the historical trajectory of um, these kinds of issues. You know, Kiev in the 19th century was primarily a Polish city, as far as I understand it. Uh, it was not a Russian city, uh, you know, in any way. Um, and it wasn't, as far as I remember, and this is again, Heather Coleman's research, um, it wasn't really until the celebration of the, you know, 900 years of the baptism of Kiev in, in um, mm. uh, 1898, that there was this like, sort of recover, remembering, oh yeah, Kiev is where it all started. And that's the mother of Russian cities and, you know, this kind of stuff. So even that discourse itself, to some degree, is a kind of, you know, relatively modern kind of construct. Um, and I'm sure there are some people for whom it resonates and some people, I think it's, it depends on how actively engaged you are with, um, you know, with, uh, with the discourses of the church, right? If this is stuff you read and stuff you follow, um, then, um, you know, it's going to, uh, it's going to be something that may shape you and and influence you. But if it's somebody, you know, if you're if you're somebody who doesn't really pay attention to that, maybe it doesn't. I have seen some, you know, um, Facebook posts of people who are basically, you know, rah rah, totally behind this kind of idea. So it is having an impact, but mm -hmm. how widespread, I I don't know. Thank you. As a quick follow up to that one, when exactly did we decide that Crimea was holy to uh, to Russia? Oh yeah, thank you for uh, for addressing that because I wanted to talk about that. Um, you know, when when they annexed Crimea, there's this kind of fascinating, um, you know, bizarre. Putin makes this speech that Crimea has always been Russian land because that's where Vladimir was baptized, and it's like, did you not read the history books? The reason Vladimir goes there to be baptized is because it was Byzantine territory. <laughs> you know, it was never Russian land until the 18th century. Um, and after Catherine, um, you know, it takes Crimea, it was really this historical, classical connection that they really celebrated. Um, and it's, uh, this is the work of Mark Kozelski talking about how Crimea becomes sacred Orthodox territory against, I think, mostly connected to the Crimean War, um, when, when Crimea is, you know, Russian land, you know. Um, I mean, I mean, I remember at the time, I mean, my first reaction was, was that the, uh, the Russians were treating Crimea in 2014, the way that the British and the French were treating it in um, 1854, in the sense that it's discreet, it's isolated, you can have a limited war there, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily spill out, uh, that was 2014, and of course now, right. Yeah. Do I hear any more questions or see any more questions? I see Judith has one. Judith oh, back. wait, where's Judith? She's got her hand up. Oh, there we are. Hello, Judith. Hi there. Um, I'm just wondering if you know of a figure along the lines of someone like Father Alexander Men, who exists in Russia right now. Hmm. There is, I don't know that there's anybody who has quite the renown and you know public attention that father alexander main had but there are certainly people who share his sort of vision and worldview and things like that uh there were a handful of priests i know of one you know father alexander parisov if i remember his name correctly um who were you know kind of connected to maine in the late soviet period and have kind of carried on some of those traditions um, in their parishes and attract a certain kind of person who, who likes that ethos that it creates. And of course, there were other really important, um, I don't know if you want to call them dissident priests, right? But, uh, but priests who really represented, who were, who were critical of the state and critical of um, the church's alliance with the state. Um, Father Edelgeim, who was murdered um, some years ago, 
uh, was a kind of key example of this. Um, Father Mitrofanov in St. Petersburg, who has been silenced years ago because of his outspokenness, was basically told by the Moscow Patriarchy not to speak to the press anymore. Um, so, um, so there are these voices out there, but they, the Patriarchate has, um, has, you know, it's kind of like in the Putin regime, there's been this kind of process of silencing dissident voices. There's actually a whole, there's a very nice book um, by uh, Hannah Stella about the mediatization of Russian orthodoxy. The book just came out with Rutledge um, where she, um, you know, she has a very nuanced uh, layered approach to understanding what's happening within the Russian Orthodox Church. And there's, she has a whole chapter on kind of dissident voices within or critical voices within the Orthodox Church. And there's a, a website um, where, often anonymously or whatever, but people um, find ways of communicating their, um, their sort of discontent with things. But of course, one of the great things about, uh, about Father Alexander Maine was his, his sort of universal vision, right? This sort of orthodoxy that was open, open to the modern world, open to dialoguing with science, open to dialoguing with other Christians, even with other religions. Um, and, I, and I'm sure there are people like that in the Russian Orthodox Church today, but they, you know, the, the, the more conservative voices um, are, are really dominating, so it seems to me. Um, and we're coming to an end. Um, uh, Scott, I really appreciated not only the information, but also the, the conversational demeanor. Um, I appreciate it also that you speak slowly and that it's, uh, it's very easy to pick up the ideas. I see here a comment from uh, Anka to speed up, and I don't know who that's directed at. It must be me. <laughs> that was there uh, the whole time, actually. Solomon. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, uh, and I want to thank you for, for sharing all this with us. And, and, it's a, and you made something out of the moment as well. And come again and good luck with the book. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for everyone who came. Thanks for uh, Yanni and Anne and the Jordan Center for, for hosting this. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it.